afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding and Supporting Infant Mental Health, co-produced by CFCA and Emerging Minds. My name is Ali Chisholm, and I work with Emerging Minds National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health. In today's presentation, we'll be exploring, exploring ways that practic practitioners can feel confident to have sensitive and non-stigmatising conversations with caregivers about infant mental health and wellbeing. To expand on that, let's have a look at the learning objectives so that we can be clear about what's ahead in the next hour. So our learning outcomes are, this webinar will support practitioners to develop an understanding of infant health and wellbeing that can underpin conversations with caregivers, identify signs that infants might be struggling and start useful conversations with caregivers around infant mental health and wellbeing. As we proceed, we recognise and pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional owners of the lands we work, play and walk on throughout this country. We acknowledge and respect their traditional connections to their land and waters, culture, spirituality, family and community for the well-being of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and their families. So this is part of a webinar series, uh, CFCA and Emerging Minds um, that focuses on infant and child mental health. So an upcoming webinar will include working effectively with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families over the first thousand days of a child's life. And if you're interested, we've got previous webinars um, this year in 2021, including supporting children's wellbeing when working with separating parents, how to recognise complex trauma in infants and children to promote wellbeing, families and homelessness, supporting parents and improving outcomes for their children, and what is the social model of disability and why it, is child, why it is important in child mental health. So you can access those through the CFCA uh, website our, or Emerging Minds. So I'd like to go on to introduce our presenters today. We have Crystal Aller. So Crystal is a knowledge translation spe specialist at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. And Crystal is working on child and infant mental health research projects, as well as knowledge translation and research impact activities and strategies, all aiming to improve the child and family wellbeing. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you. And uh, we also have Carolyn Williamson. So Dr. Carolyn Williamson is a registered psychologist who has worked in community mental health and child and family health services in the UK and Australia. And Carolyn's interests are in perinatal mental health, parenting and parent-infant relationships. Welcome, Carolyn. And you can all find the bio of our presenters on the, the CFCA website as well. And I'd also like to welcome Tegan. Tegan is a family partner here with Emerging Minds. She's the mother to two twins, uh, almost four. And Tegan has navigated her way through a wide range of services to gain assistance with supporting her sons through these early through the early years of their lives. And um, she's through that experience, she's gained a lot of insight um, around how professionals can support families with infants and young children. So welcome, Tegan. Hello, everyone. And, uh, hello. And just to get started, I'd just like to um, invite our panelists to share a bit about what it is that's captured their interest in working in the field of infant mental health. So that's over to you, Crystal. Thank you, Ali. So there's a combination of personal and professional reasons for this. My mom was a psychologist and she would often meet her clients at home, both children and adults. And as a child, I would, would see the next client in our living room when I would pass it. So sometimes it was somebody I knew and sometimes it was a stranger. And I remember thinking when I grow up, I want to help people too, just like mom. And then, at first, I did not consciously think that I would work, want to work in mental health, particularly because mom advised against it. She said, when you grow up, you can be and do anything you want, except do not become a psychologist. It's too hard, too hard. So um, as an ad adult, I dutifully tried to stay away from mental health at first. I got my bachelor's in political science, master's in health promotion, and all the while trying to stay away from mental health. But the pull was just so strong and so by the time I got to doing my PhD I knew my research person passion is in mental health and specifically I knew I wanted to help children as early on as possible so I wanted to prevent 
the long list of mental health and physical problems that they can experience later in life because their mental health struggles went unnoticed when they were uh, really young. So as a researcher, I use different tools than my mother did as a psychologist. I use research, I use research translation into policy and practice, but I do hope that somewhere behind the child psychologist door, the line of children struggling is just a little bit shorter because I have help. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. And um, we need all the people we can working in this field as well. So I, your contribution is very valuable. Um, thank you for being part of the webinar today. Um, Tegan, I'm curious to hear what it is that's um, captured your interest and motivated you to be part of our webinar today. Um, well, mainly because um, to make it that little bit easier uh, for you know parents and families and practitioners to, into mental health is quite complex. And I just think if it makes it easier for the next family, then that would be a great thing. Thank you. We are grateful to have you. So thank you. And uh, Carolyn, um, what is it that's captured your interest in the field of infant mental health? Um, well, I, I'm probably similar to Crystal. I think I've always always held a passion for early intervention in mental health. Um, in the UK, I worked in adult mental health, but it was early intervention services around emerging mental health problems. And I remember kind of my reflections on that work, even though it was defined as being early intervention. And um, it didn't feel early enough. I kind of felt about that there could have been opportunities kind of earlier on in that child's life that services or supports could have come alongside parents and helped. Um, so I think for me, kind of infant mental health, you're there right at the beginning, supporting that journey um, and supporting the well-being and infant mental health. And I also think working with parents, I feel very passionate about. I think that parenthood is such a huge seismic shift in our life when we become a parent and comes with lots of emotions and um, reactions and kind of even can kind of bring to mind some of our own experiences so kind of partnering with parents to really understand their journey and um, is something I really enjoy too. Thank you. Thank you for being involved as well. And so uh, we look forward to hearing your practice wisdom as well. And so I'll now hand it over to Crystal to hear about um, your paper and infant mental health. Thank you very much. So hi everyone. As a brief introduction to infant mental health, I'll tell you a little bit about what it is, why it's important, and what the most important things to consider are based on research evidence. So if you're interested in reading more, my talking points are based on a recent paper I published together with a colleague of mine. Um, my colleague's name is Dr. Trina Henkel, and that was an Emerging Minds um, joint paper. So, so let's, let's get into it. Infant mental health is sometimes also called social and emotional well-being. So infant mental health is defined through three key aspects. The first, is a child's capacity to experience and express emotion. So babies who are doing well in relation to this aspect of mental health, they would smile and laugh when they were happy, and they would demand their nappy change when they were uncomfortable. So the second element is the baby's ability to develop relationships. So babies who do well in this regard would communicate actively with their caregivers. They would seek eye contact, for example, with their caregiver when they're spoken to. And the third element is the baby's willingness to learn from and explore their environment. So mentally healthy babies seem interested and curious in their environment. And the, the age for uh, when to define uh, a child and infant varies. So when I talk about mental health of infants or babies, I mean age from birth to 12 months. Okay, I got that right because yesterday when I was practicing, I kept saying 12 years. <laughs> So, baby, birth to 12 months is, uh, is it's a time of rapid growth. So, it's when infants develop their cognitive, their self regulation, their psychosocial skills. And early brain development is incredibly important because it has short and long term effects for the child. So, 
So we have tracked uh, through research many chronic illnesses and adult mental disorders back to poor health in infancy and early childhood. And we also do know that many babies who are struggling with their mental health, they are not getting the help they need. And we know from surveys with Australian parents that most of them can't recognize the signs of mental health struggles in their infants, and they do not know where to get help when, when signs of struggles do appear. So because of this, parents may need help from practitioners to recognize and monitor these early warning signs of struggles with their baby's mental health. That's my first point, that the mental health of babies is important. My second point is that there are signs that tell us they are struggling. So when we talk about infant mental health, we don't usually talk about symptoms or a diagnosis of disease. And the reason for that is that babies are constantly developing. The children's mental health and well-being strategy says that the mental health of babies exists on a continuum, so it moves up and down for anchor pipes, healthy, coping, struggling, unwell. And where they are at at any time, is it healthy, is it coping, is it struggling, is it unwell, that, that can change over time and it changes based on both internal and environmental influences. So the babies at, at those different um, points in the continuum, they'll, they'll need more or less support. Now, let's talk about signs that babies are unwell or struggling. For babies, these are typically less obvious than for older children. And what makes it difficult to know if there are issues is that some of these changes in their behavior and physiology can mean mental health struggles, but they can also be normal behaviors for babies at certain developmental stages. So some of the example signs of infant mental health struggles, they may include difficulties with sleeping, such as babies constantly not sleeping well, or there may be changes to their sleeping patterns. They may sleep more, less, or sleep less. The signs may also be that they seem really distressed or restless or grumpy or irritable over a long time, and it's really difficult to, to calm them down when they're upset. So another sign would be that they may be excessively clingy, not wanting to be apart from their caregiver, or it could be signs at the other end where they seem disengaged, they don't make eye contact, they, they don't want to be helped, and they may not even cry at all, or cry very little, or make very few attempts to get their needs met, like being fed or having their nappy changed. So they may also be overreacting to what's going on in their physical environment. They may react really strongly to loud noises or excessive light. They may be easily startled. So it's really about deviating from what's normal for this particular baby and watching out for signs of struggles that are persistent and severe. So my third point is that babies do well or not so well dependent on their relationships and the environment they live in. So babies are dependent on their caregiver relationships for survival and for development. So research does tell us that babies do well when they have supportive caregiver relationships, when they have positive relationships with their siblings, when their mother's been healthy in their eating and exercise behaviors during pregnancy. So all these factors and more can be protective of good mental health for babies. And babies do not do well um, when they're exposed to domestic violence, poverty, when they have low, lower birth weights, or when their caregivers use substances or when they have mental illness. So having these risk factors in the environment can mean that babies do have poor mental health outcomes. And we do know that the best protection for a baby's mental health is good attachment relationships with their caregivers. So babies who are in loving and supporting relationships where their emotional and social needs are met, they have better mental health. So relationships that are on the, at the other end of the spectrum, those are abusive, those that are neglectful, where caregivers are unavailable or unpredictable, babies tend to have poor mental health. And these risks and protective factors can have a big impact, especially because they can amplify each other uh, when they exist together, and they can interact to contribute to babies' mental health. So, so the timing is important, the intensity is important, their accumulation really matters. 
and it matters for baby's mental health whether, for example, the family has just gone through a big move to another country or another state, or there is physical illness in the family, or parents have separated. So worse yet, if this is all happening at the same time, ooh, not good at all for baby's mental health. So baby may need more support at times when there is a lot going on, just to be mindful of that. And that's why it's important to understand as much about the relationships and the environment as we can. And there are things that practitioners can recommend caregivers to do in their home and family life to, to support the baby's needs. So finally, I will briefly mention some high level considerations about these conversations with caregivers around their baby's mental health. And I know Caroline and Tegan will talk more about this. So I'll just mention three key strategies. Um, firstly, um, it's a good idea to include questions about the child's world, relationships and environment in conversations with caregivers around their mental health. Ask about their medical and physical history, but also reflect on baby's experiences, their psychological characteristics, such as emotional expressions and behaviors. Secondly, um, focus on building the confidence and competence of caregivers. Ask about what they and their family are doing well, not just where they're struggling. And ask, for example, what are some of the ways that um, caregivers can connect with their babies? Think what are the strengths in addition to vulnerabilities in these relationships that, that can be supported? And remember also that, yes, it is about the baby and the caregiver recognizing the, the mental states and their needs. However, what is needed sometimes may be also helping the caregivers understand their own emotions and their own reactions in their relationships with their babies. So thirdly, one, another helpful strategy may be to teach caregivers how to communicate with their baby in consistent and nurturing ways. And this could include simple tips and tools like showing the caregivers how to promote that two-way conversation by repeating the sounds that the baby makes and using a calm and soothing voice when they are upset and just gently rocking them for comfort. So, or, or even simply smiling back to the, to the baby to tell them that they're special and, teach, and that teaches them that a caregiver can be trusted. And, and there are several small simple ways uh, that can be used to build a loving and responsive relationship this way. And before I conclude my presentation, I'll summarize the three key messages I'd like you to take away from, from the presentation. So these are mental health of babies is important. There are signs that tell us that babies are struggling and need support for the custody. And mental health of babies is dependent on their relationships and the environment they live in. So, so to support them, we really need to look beyond their medical history at the relationships and the environment. So if you do want more information, have a look at our review paper. There's a link in the handout. And Emerging Minds also has many excellent resources on infant mental health on their website. I know Carolyn and Tegan will give you more context and in-depth information about their experiences of supporting with mental health. So I'll now hand you over to their capable hands. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. That's great. And yes, um, just in reference to Crystal's paper, there is a paper on um, why is infant mental health important you can find on our um, website. And so now moving on, we're going to invite um, Tegan to share uh, some insights from her experience um, around the importance of infant mental health. So welcome, Tegan. Hello, everyone. Um, my, this is just my understanding um, and supporting infant mental health presentation. Um, my twin sons were born premature with a low birth weight and the smallest of two was transferred back to the NICU on oxygen and he struggled during their two month hospital stay. Um, he was still gavaged, fed and struggled to feed until 48 hours before he came home. Sorry, the hospital removed the tube to get him home because his brother had been ready for weeks and I wanted the boys home together. 
At this time, I didn't have stable housing as I was escaping DV from the boy's father and I was quite isolated and I was experiencing high levels of anxiety and needed to think about their, their physical as well as social and emotional health. So obviously I was looking for support from any services that were available. I was experiencing everyday stress, which I now know made it harder for my children to cope. I struggled to get my youngest to feed. I had a nurse visit me from in my emergency hotel room. She was from the special care nursery and I could tell that she was stressed and so was I. She quite aggressively told me I had to formula top up my youngest as he'd only gained 10 grams in a week and his brother had gained 100 grams. It's hard to be able to think about everything that you need to when you are living in a situation like this. So I have learned that there are many things that practitioners and services can do to make a difference for parents in a situation like I was. Um, I believe that parents' mental health needs to be a priority and taken care of first so that are able to support their children in the best way they can. As a single parent, I'm the key person who will be with them, setting them up for the rest of their life. And I'm always thinking about the fact that I am the one preparing them for well to be adults. <clears throat> um, I believe services and practitioners can be so important in their approaches to helping parents and caregivers um, preparing their children for adult life. Um, because I have twins, I can see the difference as my boys grow up together, where one child is struggling in some areas and the other isn't so much. I believe it's my knowledge as their mum that is so important in letting practitioners know about what they'll be working with when they support my child and our, and our family. <clears throat> um, when you are talking with parents and caregivers about their children's well or baby's well-being, there are some key things that can make a world of difference to us and it doesn't take much to include in your appointments and conversations. We know our babies <clears throat> better than anyone, so it's really important that we are listened to and believed. What, are you, what you're seeing in a short appointment time often will not reflect what we're experiencing for the rest of the time. Um, remember to show empathy, judgments about how we are managing whatever we are struggling with are not helpful to a parent or our children and will only make us feel more isolated than we already are. I was looking and asking for help and support and trying to do the best I could for my child who I know was struggling. I often just needed to be shown some humanity. Um, parents often need and want information so they can understand what they're dealing with. Um, for myself, I needed to learn about sensory processing, so I had the knowledge to help my son with what he was going through. And a lot of the ideas of what I needed to do weren't practical things that would work for our situation. Um, I didn't expect a quick fix, but I did, ex did expect more individualised support and strategies that helped me understand and step, and step me through what I needed to be thinking about when I responded to my son's frustrations. Um, <clears throat> for me, learning about in infant mental health and being educated as a parent is something that is very important. If someone had sat me down at the beginning and talked, talked to me about infant and children's mental health and wellbeing, it would have been really helpful. Just having the many aspects of children's mental health and the impacts of things like housing, uh, social connections, my stress levels, et cetera, ex explained to me in a way that I could understand would um, had saved me having to work these things out on my own along the way. Um, and this would have given me more of an understanding on how to support my son's mental health and wellbeing. Um, I can see that my son's frustration levels have decreased over the years, so overall the services have helped but there have been times when I've accessed services for my son that have cost a lot of money and they were not that practical for me to put in place in our situation. Um, when thinking about supporting infant mental health, remember that there's a lot of stigma for parents looking for support. Um, so it's important whatever reason you're looking for help 
from services, parents and caregivers will obviously respond better when they don't feel judged and they feel heard. Um, I'm still going through the process of getting supports, particularly helping one of my sons, and it can be hard without a clear diagnosis or description of what he's going through. Uh, one of the things I've found most helpful along the way have been parenting groups and support groups. So for practitioners to link parents and caregivers in with people who are going through similar, similar experiences can be really helpful. Um, for me, just having those connections helped me feel less isolated. And there were some particularly help, helpful social workers from a children's community centre who have stood out for me from a time when I needed support. Uh, they invited me to social groups and just engaged with me and checked in with me and this made a difference uh, for my family. Um, another helpful example of supports that have also stood out for me was the Early Childhood and Family Service. Just the little things that went a long way in helping. They offered to write support letters uh, when I had to go through family court <clears throat> as well as making regular visits and they supported linking me in with NDIS for my son and helped me to understand what I needed to know about this. And they have really just kept in touch right through to make sure my son's wellbeing is supported and, and that my, my needs as a parent are looked after so I can be in the best position to support my children. Um, I can't emphasise enough how much of a difference the children's community centres and early childhood services um, has made, like the consistent phone calls, um, <clears throat> consistent practitioners, invites to support groups and play groups. Um, that was extremely helpful for my families. Um, we are always learning as our children grow through different stages and every baby and child will have different things that we need to deal with along the way and need different supports to be put in place. Our services can help us navigate through the supports and services that we need to use. Uh, if we are helped to understand these ourselves, um, our babies and children will benefit. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tegan. It's um, very valuable hearing from your um, own experience and your insight, and I'm sure many um, practitioners and professionals and other people working with families will have gained a lot from hearing from you today. So um, thank you so much for being here, just to hear about how um, helpful it is to have that regular contact and engagement with um, other parents and other support groups. It's really helpful to hear. So thank you very much. Um, and now I'd like to reintroduce you to Carolyn. And so Carolyn's going to tell us a little bit about her experience in uh, infant mental health, and then we'll have time for Q and A and towards the end. So just I'm having a bit of trouble with my slides, but just bear with me, um, Carolyn. Yes, no problem. <laughs> there we go. I'll, I'll begin anyway. Thank you, Tegan. Um, I just probably also want to extend my thanks for sharing um, your experiences and examples of what was supported and also reflections on um, what opportunities were perhaps overlooked in your journey and what might have been helpful that I think we can all take learnings from. Um, I'd like to share some of my reflections and experiences of approaching conversations with parents about infant mental health and opportunities um, I find to offer support. And my reflections are based primarily on experiences of working as a parent infant therapist in a child and family health service. So in this service, parents will access support for um, different reasons and different opportunities present. So it may be for a routine health check. Um, parents might be experiencing issues around feeding or settling. Um, they might not be enjoying certain aspects of parenting or struggling to make sense of certain behaviours. Um, they may be experiencing challenges in the relationships or might be experiencing you know, their own powerful emotions uh, such as anxiety and depression. And I suppose it's my view that really each consult that we have with an infant and a parent can be an opportunity to start that conversation. Um, and, uh, and as Crystal and Tegan mentioned, I think if we can aim to make conversations about emotional development 
as important as conversations that we might have about growth and physical development put it on the agenda right at the beginning and then it can start to reframe these conversations reduce kind of stigma um, and the blame that Tika mentioned um, that we're not just having conversations when we notice a concern but we're sharing information right from the beginning about what can promote emotional uh, well-being in infants so um, the slide with the continuum on, I find that this can be a, a really useful place to um, start with families and introduce this visual image um, about infants' emotional well-being being on a continuum. Um, because I think it really normalises the idea that for any of us, for each of us, including babies and infants, that mental health and emotional well-being isn't a static position. We're not either well or unwell but rather our position on the continuum can change over time. Um, it, the parent-infant relationship is also highlighted underneath here because this really does, as been mentioned, underpin infant mental health. We can't think about or support infant mental health without thinking about this relationship because it's through this relationship how babies learn to understand and express emotion and develop uh, confidence in the world. So. Sharing this continuum um, with a parent can be an entry into a discussion. So kind of even having this visually available um, and it can start the discussion about um, what health, healthy infant mental health like, might look like. So we might start to think with parents about areas of an infant's life, such as um, sleep, um, activity level, uh, feeding, emotional expression, and um, interest that they show in the world, and think about how each of these areas might look for babies when things are going well. Um, and as Tegan mentioned, I think we're bringing together then the parents, you know, observations about the uniqueness of their child, what they notice, and also joining that and sharing what we might expect to, know, to notice. So we're coming kind of from sharing knowledge about that really. Um, and then that conversation can, that reflective conversation can, can continue. Um, and we might think about what we might notice if, you know, our infant or our baby wasn't coping so well. So, you know, we might ask, do you notice changes in your infant's sleeping or routine when they appear to be struggling? You know, or kind of vice versa, if we notice changes in our baby's sleep and activity levels, what might be going on for them? Um, and presenting the kind of this continuum as well also presents the opportunity to think about um, how a child's environment and the relationships, uh, the experiences, um, family stress and support, all have the potential to influence kind of a person's position on that continuum and that being in either direction so we might kind of um have those curious questions around do you notice that your infant might react differently in different situations or how does your baby adjust to changes in routine um, or kind of really explore if there have been any changes recently that might influence where your baby might find themselves on that continuum. So, um, as Chris, Crystal mentioned about trying to think about the environment, using this in this way opens up to think about what might influence where somebody might be. Um, I think it's really important to talk about the reciprocal nature of the infant-parent relationship. Uh, just as a reminder that the well-being of one, so either for the parent or the infant, will always influence the well-being of the other, as Tegan highlighted. So when we're attending to and in, an supporting infant mental health, we have to give attention to the parent as well. I think it's equally, equally important to understand and connect with a parent's journey and their experiences and attend to their relationship with the infant. And I think sharing this as well will help parents understand sometimes that we might ask or we might have questions or think about what support we might provide that's not just focused on the infant the, as an individual but kind of supports around the family and uh, trying to think about how we manage their circumstances so if we move on to the next slide um kind of i've just probably highlighted here that uh, when we're having conversations about child development, and I'm sure that people do anyway, but we kind of 
I think we always try and endeavour to approach those conversations from a position of really wanting to be an ally or a partner with a parent that we kind of are joining, I suppose, with this mutual goal of supporting an infant's health and development and that the parents bring their expertise about their child and circumstances and, and our goal um, is to tailor the information and the guidance that we might know um, about infant mental health really to the individual needs of that child. Um, as we've mentioned, kind of highlighting that infant's emotional development is one aspect of development that that alongside physical development, cognitive development, and that they all influence one another. So we need to give equal attention um, to kind of each really. Um, and with that in mind, probably even wondering ourselves, what do we ask if we look at our own assessments or kind of our own um, ways we engage with family? What do we ask about infant mental health and what do we include? Um, and we might begin that with very general and open questions, such as the one I've highlighted here about temperament, you know, just wondering about an, an infant's temperament. And this might help us to understand how a parent experiences the baby. And it also might just present, you know, another opening opportunity really to talk about differences in infants' temperaments and the challenges and joys around that and support parents to think about how how we can tailor and, ad and adapt parenting to, to the ch child temperament to nurture that development. Um, I do acknowledge it can be trickier to examine and support social and emotional development than say gross motor development because you know much of, of emotion we think of as being internal um, but as Crystal highlighted that most emotional responses in infants will present as behaviours or physiological responses such as kind of excessive crying or sleep or feeding issues and kind of unsettled behaviours. So and a kind of another way of engaging and supporting infant mental health, uh, mental health might be to kind of explore that with uh, parents. You know, does your baby have a routine around sleeping and eating? Um, how does your child let you know that they're hungry or tired or need a nappy change? So we're starting to understand how they might express that need. How do they let you know when they need your clothes? So, um, you know, sharing that every infant, you know, can become easily over, overwhelmed by unfamiliar sensations in their, in their environment, such as noises or new smells or separations, because they're developing that repertoire of emotions and beginning to understand what that is and need somebody to do that alongside them. So we might consider with parents, you know, what does your, when they're upset, what helps them to your baby to calm down? Does your baby like to be picked up and held? How does your baby react when you pick her up and talk to her? Also kind of thinking that that gives us some kind of understanding about the relationship as well. I've stressed here again the importance of the parent-infant relationship that I realise I'm kind of coming back to through, throughout, but I think we, it's it's how in, infants come to understand and the world understand themselves and the world around them. So, if we can spend time exploring this too with parents, you know, we might gently explore what's it like being a parent to to this particular infant and what do you enjoy the most and what do you enjoy less. Um, and as, as has been highlighted from the other presenters, really trying to understand the context that parents are raising their children in, you know, general questions like this on the slide or perhaps specific questions. Can I ask about how you're coping at the moment? And, you know, do you have any other supports that you have either from family or services? And how would you recognise if things were becoming more challenging and difficult for you and for your family? Um, so if we move to slide four, the next slide, we've we thought about laying the foundations for supporting infant mental health. And I suppose what we're really highlighting is supporting parents to think about their baby as an emotional being that needs help and guidance to make sense of emotions and learn to regulate emotions. Um, having those conversations where we adopt that curious position alongside a parent about what might be going on inside their baby um, an infant or wondering about what the meaning is behind the behaviours that we observe. 
um, I will often encourage parents to kind of notice and name and link emotions out loud with their infant as an opportunity to support that development. You know, thinking that for an infant, um, it's as though feelings inside them might just happen almost randomly, you know, that you know might start squirming or become uncomfortable and become upset. And if they're left to manage that on their own, it's like the brain and the nervous system are really trying to make sense of that feeling, but they've got nothing to anchor it to or to connect it to, to the outside world. And often automatically as parents, we will make that link, you know, we'll kind of recognize it and maybe think it's a nappy change that's needed or that they're cold. But if we're able to kind of say that out loud, that we're noticing it, that we're, oh, you're upset now and, oh, let's, you need a nappy change, then it begins to help infants to kind of um, recognize emotions and anchor it as well to some, make sense of and the meaning behind their emotions. Um, as has been mentioned, kind of another um, way of providing support might be around pro providing practical support and guidance around establishing routines um, with parents. I think as Tegan highlighted, I think if we've set the foundations of trying to understand um, an individual's uh, the individual infant and their circumstances, then we can tailor that support that we provide. But we might encourage parents to talk to the baby about their routines, talk about what they're doing in the moment with the baby to help them prepare and support them to feel secure. You know, I'm going to pick you up now or let's put you in the chair so that it's preparing them and you're naming what you're doing. Um, supporting parents, similarly supporting parents to talk to the babies about the new sounds and experiences and, and letting them know what they're hearing and noticing, just reminding them that they maybe need to stay very close at first as they warm up to those new places um, so that they begin to feel safe and secure to explore the world. Um, you know, giving ideas around age appropriate play and ways to connect with the baby, you know, songs and nursery rhymes, using baby names in songs to make them feel special and important um, and connecting with community groups and support. So really becoming familiar with um, what groups are and services and might be on offer in the local area um, so that, you know, and we can link in and be aware of those services to support parents to link into them as well. Um, on the next slide, I, I, I kind of recognise there might be times that parents might present with an issue or a behaviour that they're struggling with. And while we might kind of think about or wonder about infant mental health, parents might not um, recognise it as such or might just be looking for help to fix the behaviour, feeling really overwhelmed. Um, and I suppose in those instances, I think we need to first really hold and connect to the parents' experiences before we wonder about the baby. So I know I've highlighted ways that we might kind of curiously wonder with parents about what's going on for the child. But if we were to do this straight away in those instances and ask what do you think is bothering her, then the parent can often feel frustrated and overwhelmed or even quite anxious if they don't know and they've come to you for support. So I think it's important also to just acknowledge how stressful and overwhelming it can be when we're unsure how to respond or don't know what's causing behaviours. And we might have more success in supporting parents if, in these moments if we first validate their struggle, you know, kind of acknowledging that it's really hard work taking care of a baby and think about how can we help you and support you um, in those moments. And um, just continuing to explore and attend to both. And, and I think once we've validated and supported parents, then we can kind of bridge um, and attend to the infant and be able to wonder then about their experiences. Um, if we move along to the next slide, uh, thanks Ali. I think um, this slide on reflective uh, parenting, I think I'm just probably highlighting that. I think what we have been talking about throughout my presentation is really trying to support a parent's reflective capacity, thinking about what lies beneath behaviour and what might be going on inside our baby. And, and, I, and I feel that support in kind of reflective parenting, as it's named here, is really our biggest opportunity to support infant mental health. 
um, researchers found in the first two years of life that the most important factor in a child's development was how well mothers were able to interpret the baby's feelings. And this was a much stronger predictor than family background and socioeconomic status. So the better a mother was at interpreting their infant's intentions and moods, then the faster the infant becomes in expressing their thoughts and feelings through language and play. And obviously being able to do that helps them to have healthy relationships and um, in as they progress forward. Um, and I think when we're supporting reflective parenting, we're really helping a parent understand their own emotions as well, and then using this to bridge to the child and their emotional world. world. So supporting parents to build in a pause, if you like. So when they experience a struggle, you know, what's happening right now? What am I noticing for me? And what am I noticing for my baby? Um, and then the final slide, I, I just kind of, I, I think that um, just acknowledging that there will oft, still always oft, or still often be parents and families that maybe need the support beyond what we can offer. And then our role might be to support parents to connect with other services. Um, and I think it can feel confusing enough at times for professionals to know what services are out there kind of that change month to month. And so kind of I was encouraging to stay involved as we kind of um, stay involved with families while they wait to be seen by the right um, support, that we still have that role to play in continuing to promote the infant well-being through these reflective conversations and identifying and supporting the strengths in the family. Thanks, Sally. Sorry, I feel like I might have gone Thank a lot you. over there, but no, I hope that's it's great. okay. <laughs> Uh, so many excellent strategies to share today so thank you for going over them um i think it's really interesting to think about that continuum and when there's opportunities to continue some support for the family and some some guidance and some of those strategies you mentioned and other times when we're looking for other referral pathways if they're mm -hmm. more struggling or down the continuum and it's so helpful to hear that it's you know with that children that age it is always changing um and fluctuating mm -hmm. and that that we can go as we can as adults, you know, up and down mm. the continuum. Um, and it's obviously very contextual as well. Yes, so, yeah. Thank you. I'm just aware thank that we probably have some questions coming in, so we may um, move on to a few quick Q&A now, I think. Um, just before we do that, um, I just, uh, no, that's all, we're all good to go. We might just change the slides. <laughs> thank you. So thank you everyone for your presentations and contribution. Um, we can invite Crystal back to the screen um, and Tegan as well. So um, although we don't see Tegan uh, here on the screen, we've got her as her audio. So Tegan is with us for some Q and A. And so I, um, that's so helpful. Thank you to to your for your presentations. Um, so I've got a question. What this is probably recapping a little bit. So I'm um, over to perhaps to, to hear from Teague in a little bit. So what can practitioners do to better support parents um, who have young children struggling with social and emotional well-being? Um, I believe that um, if practitioners were practical, um, can provide like a comfortable space for children to play in, in the appointment. So then the parents. Mm -hmm talk and the practitioners can listen, everyone's quite you know, more relaxed. Um, and that no matter what the issue, whether it be a child not sleeping or behaviour, it's beneficial for the practice, practitioners just to listen, whatever the parents' concerns are, and to continue to follow up and engage with the family. Um, maybe have like a block of appointments, much like a physio or mental health care plan block. So it's like the same person that you're seeing overall. Um, and then in this time, the family could build some trust and rapport with the practitioners um, and the practitioners can get a whole approach of what is really happening with the um, family's lives and whether it be clinical, social, emotional, all of the above. So, Mm, yeah. Thanks, Tegan. Thank you. 
Um, and I'm just thinking, so this webinar, people who have joined us today may um, be just wanting to start, show some interest in the field and to start to develop their um, professions or maybe further down and experienced in that. So I'm just wondering from um, your paper, Crystal, did, was there uh, some strategies for practitioners that are wanting to start to explore and support infants in their work with families? Or something came out of your research? That's a great question. Thank you. One easy step is go seek more information. The, there's, there are actually lots of resources available that also links to the resources uh, for more information in our paper. So there are links to online courses, podcasts, more webinars. Um, there's, there's lots of um, useful useful links and, and sources on the Emerging Minds website. So I guess another step could be to reflect on the different aspects of, of the practice that may support better outcomes for referrals and also for caregivers self-care. So, so thinking about things like, um, so how, how to tap into those networks of support? How do I how do I focus more on infants and the engaged families in my practice? How do I, um, in my assessment processes, support um, consistently asking questions about babies' mental, social and emotional well-being, for example? And also being, becoming more aware of, yes, there are risk and protective factors at play. Um, and how to use them in initial uh, conversations with caregivers and how to use them for support. So, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot around awareness you can do and just you, use, there's lots of links and links and, and uh, resources also in our paper. So just feel free to use them as well, I think. Thank you. Thank you. And Carolyn, I'm wondering from a child and fam from a child and family health service, and um, if practitioners are wanting to support and have those conversations with parents, but not sure um, or confident in starting those conversations. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions in an organisation or in your practice how clinicians or practitioners can can gain con look for confidence or find some knowledge or Yes, yeah, I think it, it can be, can it? I think sometimes we can really, um, I think because of what Tegan highlighted as well, we can sometimes kind of feel a bit hesitant in case we're wondering what the parents' experience is, is going to be of us talking about those things, about raising a topic like infant mental health and, you know, can feel a bit like, oh, you know, does this mean that kind of something's wrong? And I think... Um, I suppose that's kind of why I try and think about how do we frame it in um, just understanding generally the developmental needs of a child, you know, that this is one area that, you know, so, and, and I suppose when you said then, like, what could help hesitancy, I think it's even thinking about what assessments perhaps that we do already that are routine and, and how do we introduce it, that this is just one aspect of development that we're here to partner with you and, and try and support and nurture and kind of come alongside you into trying to understand. So we're not, as I mentioned, we're not just raising it when that there's a concern there, that it, it's, it's just part of that routine conversation really. Um, and, and I think in the same way that we think about infants or babies learning kind of physical developments and milestones, kind of talking about that for infants, they don't have a template for emotions, you know, that they, rely, they do rely on others to name and um, help them understand emotions. And then we can then open up a conversation around, so what can we do together to think about how we might support that? You know, how can we think about opportunities to um, help out? What, 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 what can we notice in our child when they maybe are kind of got a need? You know, that it doesn't necessarily mean that anything's wrong, but when they're trying to express an emotion, what do we notice in them? Kind of that curiosity about that and how can we help them to feel more secure and um, confident in exploring the world, you know, so that they kind of see that kind of to begin with that might be alongside a parent and being held, you know, being feeling that that has to come from a place of safety. And, and so, yeah, so I think I think trying to just as you, as we've talked about, just trying to make it part of routine 
conversations mm -hmm. and I think that the strength in that as well is that then if if we've um, in our relationship with a parent or even if parents access support at other times if we've kind of this this has been a part of normal conversations then it makes it easier down the track to kind of raise um kind of issues that we're wondering about because it's kind of already got a framework in in our minds that emotional development is something that we can think about together thank you i hope that answers um, that yes <laughs> um i like the idea of a, it becoming part of the routine sort of developmental Ooh. checks and being able to have those conversations and also you um highlighted a couple of times about really building that becoming an ally with the parent and it reminds yeah, me of Tegan. Yeah. Tegan, when you were speaking of, um, you know, being building that relationship and being available and um, and having, you know, checking up regularly and um, starting to develop that relationship and getting to know all of what might be happening if that's what a um, family are coming to, if they're coming with a few um, multiple sort of things happening and trying to understand the behaviour or what's happening, what's the emotion yeah. behind the behaviour. So. It gives an opportunity to start to have those conversations. Uh, is it common to see symptoms of, it, of mental health challenges in infants for parents who are not experiencing their own mental health challenges or adversities or trauma? Yes, yeah. Um, so I think so I think often I, I, when I was thinking about that then I think in my mind I went straight to all oh, I, I feel like that would be possible you know but I think I was then also reminded about thinking about that reciprocal nature of the relationship sorry if I've interrupted anybody else answering that I kind of think about how the well-being in one kind of really impacts on the well-being of another that often when I see parents if there is struggles with an infant's um you know, emotional well-being, if you like, and that really can, uh, our, the own parents' own continuum, if it likes, can really kind of affect how they're emotionally adjusting to that, and it could be a struggle, and that, you know, that it can be quite difficult to make sense of things. So that's not to say that they'll always be there together, but I think we're very much kind of in tune, if you like, really, in trying to equally support the parent as much as the infant in those, those occasions. Thank you. Um, uh, we have another question here um, regarding sort of normal infant sleep and giving that wide and varied presentation of infant sleep. That's obviously there's a lot of um, variation in what is normal. Um, you know, how do you determine when there are some, some sleep issues becomes more of a mental health struggles or you know it's classed as typical? Um, I wonder, Carolyn, if you can answer that one. It's a good question because I think we often, um, you know, especially as a parent, we can, can become um, quite anxious if we're feeling that um, an infant's not getting enough sleep or kind of sleeping too much. And so I think what I would probably um, try to explore, as well as kind of maybe giving information about what maybe um, sleep patterns we might notice with an infant and what routines that we might expect but also kind of really try and understand again the parents experience of that kind of how much um it, it, is it an issue to them like what's what's their struggle with that um sleep i think that would help me to determine and understand infant sleeps a, a bit more about what's going on and um how is this impacting on on the parent or the or the family and kind of try and really understand and piece together the impact of um kind of that sleep routine on all the family thank you Christine, I'd, like to, I wanted to... I'd like to add to that just my two cents that it's really about looking out for persistent sleep problems things that happen over a long time and um, I mean, it's hard to give an exact time period. This is after if if, you ha if your child hasn't been sleeping properly after one day or three days or weeks or or months. I don't get don't go into months. It's, that's too long. But um, it's, it's hard to give an exact because it's not an exact science. All babies are different. So just thank you. Just look out for things that happen over a long time. Don't let it get to too long. 
um, also, um, if a parent or, um, has followed the parenting advice, like um, the parent information line or the GP and hospitals advice, and um, that they have a good routine in place and healthy meals and healthy play and engaging with their child. If they're in doubt, um, you know, they should always, and they've got all those things in place, they should always just ask because generally, mm. if you've done all of that and they're still not, the child still isn't settling for hours and hours, obviously there's something mm. else got wrong. Mm. Mm. Just ask, but I guess. Thank you. Yes. And um, the next question as well is, um, do you, that's come in is, do you have advice to practitioners when working with parents who are facing multiple adversities or come in when there's a lot going on, uh, not just one, if not just focused on sleep or you find out when you're exploring sleep, there's actually a lot more coming. Do you have advice to practitioners on you know, how to best support families when there's so much um, happening at the um, time? Yeah, like to listen to the parents' initial concerns without um, an in individual opinion or judgment, and mm -hmm. um, uh, and sometimes parents and caregivers who are facing multiple adversities in their lives can be extremely overwhelmed, and may may actually need help working out what needs to be addressed first and in which order. Mm -hmm. um, and help them prioritise what needs attention first, what practical things need addressing. And it can be helpful for you to just listen and help them get um, get clear and make sense of their, their own situation and just making the time to listen and then map out a way forward through, you know, whatever, whatever um, is going on in their families, their lives. So, yeah. And that can be, um, sounds like having that regular appointments and that engagement with them and the relationship with the clinicians can help that too, and from what you mentioned yeah. in your presentation, Tegan. Thank you. And I suppose I was just thinking, Ali, just kind of to add to that, because I kind of really resonated in kind of like we say, listening to and trying to understand kind of, you know, the parents' circumstances. And I was also thinking even in terms of, you know, building that relationship and, engaging with parents if it, it might our connecting point might not be to begin with about infant mental health it might be that we connect to support a parent that is facing some adversity in their life either you know kind of some housing or financial problem and if we can kind of I suppose help them as to to support them in that and think about that and kind of get them the supports that they need then that's kind of strengthening a kind of our relationship and partnership with a with a parent as well that kind of then um, can then um, pave the way sometimes to some of those trickier conversations about how do we also think that this might be um, impacting in the family as well. So I think joining them and trying to think about and get some insight into the impact of those adversities on, on themselves and also on the family can be really helpful. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Can I just make one more suggestion? Yeah. Um, I know this is a bit um, prior to a parent coming and um, saying I need help um, with, you know, sleep or stress or whatever's happening at the time, but it would be really helpful, I think, if they set up something like they do with breastfeeding, you know, that, uh, when you first have your baby. So yeah. to understand all the aspects and they feel you know make it comfortable so they can ask for help so it's not mm. you know the scary thing I'm struggling um I don't want to ask for help you know no one wants to admit they're struggling do they so. mm. what a good initiative what a good idea yeah. normalize the sleeping support breastfeeding yeah good idea um so we have uh, time for one more question uh, before we wrap up. There's a lot of questions have come in around ask, people asking about tools. So what emotional uh, wellbeing screening tools can practitioners use in practice for infant mental health? If anyone knows of any to share. 
So I can begin with kind of reflections on kind of thinking about what we use within a child and family health service. And um, so within child and family health, they use a, a um, an ages and stages questionnaire. Um, and interestingly, there's one specifically for social and emotional development. As a part of routine, we'll often complete the ASQ, um, but it's not as routine to complete the ASQ uh, social and emotional scale. So I think um, that can be useful. I, I probably, when you mentioned then, Ali, about screening, um, I, I kind of felt like it would be perhaps, it is a screening, but I thought actually also even just using that kind of, a tool, if you like, as a reflective tool, that it's not necessarily to screen is there a problem or is there not, but actually it being an opportunity to think about and just start that reflective conversation with a parent about social and emotional well-being. You know, do we what do we notice? Do we notice changes in sleeping? That you know, so it not just being kind of a screen, but actually a conversation starter or kind of support would be how I would encourage it to be used really. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm just aware we're time, running out of time. Um, the, I just want to acknowledge that there's been um, quite a few questions coming in around more specific questions looking for um, some individual sort of support and we don't have scope for that today. Um, I know that in, you know, sometimes this can raise some reflections on our own experiences and families. So I just want to ensure that if you, or mention that if you're looking for some additional support, to, um, there are you know, trusted professionals such as your child, maternal health nurse or your GP, if you um, wanted to seek some more uh, individualised support. And there's also online resources such as the um, the Panda website or Beyond Blue. And so we'll include some of those list of resources as well as the Parenting Helpline. We'll include that in our resources um, today. So thank you once again, everyone, for being contributing and being part of the webinar. I'm sure many people have found that really valuable, listening and hearing your experiences. Um, Thanks also to the CFCA for your behind the scenes support and please follow the links on the screen and our Merging Minds website as well as CFCA to continue the conversation and find the recording and find those additional resources as well. So thanks, Crystal, Carolyn, Tegan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you.